claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. And there cannot be different rules for different people in this country or in this state. And former presidents are no different. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Cross Connection. I'm Tiffany Cross. And as you just saw, to cap up the week, Donald Trump is feeling that heat because his legal woes are piling up. So from being sued by the state of New York for $250 million for alleged business fraud to an appeals court siding with the Justice Department and allowing the DOJ to review classified documents seized from Mar-a-Lago to, of course, now the special master demanding that Trump back up his claim that the FBI planted evidence during the search of Mar-a-Lago. Trump has until next Friday to prove that. The judge essentially like, we don't believe you, you need more people. You can guess how insurrectionist inspirationist is reacting, of course, by throwing a fit online. All right, here with me is political contributor Jason Johnson, who was late this morning, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> also joining me is MSNBC legal analyst and civil rights attorney Charles Coleman Jr., who was on time this morning. So thank you, gentlemen, uh, for being here. Jason, you're here with me uh, on set um, late. I, I want to start with you because really, what do you make of all of this? I know you've been talking about it all week. Yes. Um, but what do you make of all of this? Because it, it does seem like he's, he was always em embattled with yeah. these legal woes, and we still have yet to see him being held accountable. So your thoughts? Well, you know, in the main thing, Tiffany, my attitude has always been, tell me when the orange jump shoot shows, shows right. up, right? Like, right. until someone's going to jail, yeah. I don't tend to get that excited about these sort of idiosyncrasies of the case. But I do think it's important that his latest gambit, ah, the special master, that will stall things for me, that didn't work out. His, so, his excuse of like, oh, hey, I need the documents back. Basically, judges are saying that's not going to work. His argument that, hey, they sprinkled some crack, you know, they, they, they planted yeah. evidence on yeah. me. Yeah. That didn't work either. So I think... The judge set me up. Exactly. Just, <laughs> <laughs> very fitting for D.C. residents. They know what we're talking about. So, yeah, so that's the thing. Yeah. Like, none of his tricks have worked this week. Um, and, and Tish James, actually, I think, is the only sort of turning point. I think there's going to be a race to see who gets a conviction first. I'm betting on Tish James because I haven't been that impressed with what I've seen from Mayor Garland. Yeah, and don't forget Georgia either. Exactly. Bonnie Willis. Uh, Charles Coleman, you're the resident uh, lawyer here with us. What do you think? I mean, does this bring us any closer to seeing Donald Trump? Trump held accountable. Also curious your thoughts. If he is never held accountable, what does that say to the rest of Americans about our justice system? Well, Tiffany, I think that both of those are very, very great questions. The first one, in terms of him being held accountable, not so much. I tend to agree with Jason here. This is a guy who, from the civil side, has gotten sued literally hundreds of times. But this is a little bit different because it carries with the criminal referrals. Now, the question becomes, with those referrals, what are DOJ, the IRS, and potentially the SDNY, who have already looked at this information, going to do with it because they've seen it before? And so it could be that throughout the course of this investigation, there were new witnesses who were cultivated new information that allows them to go back and revisit the notion of an indictment and prosecution. But generally speaking, from an accountability place, I don't necessarily know that we are leaps and bounds away from seeing what we have already be different with respect to Donald Trump. I do think that Jason is right again when you talk about the special master in terms of the fact that, yo, you got to be careful with what you ask for because when you get it, it may not work out the way that you thought that it would. And I think that that's what we saw with this special master, Judge Deary, who's setting a very, very different tone when it comes to what we're seeing from the bench when dealing with Donald Trump and his lawyers. He has made it clear, he's made it clear that he is not going to deal with the shenanigans. He's not going to deal with the delay tactics. He's also not going to allow the public narrative around the plain of evidence, or as you so eloquently referenced, the judge set me up, or they set me up. <laughs> he's not going to allow that, that to continue. Um, and so I think that we're seeing a bit of a turning of the tide. But with respect to a conviction, I think that Fannie Willis still has the best track down in Fulton County, Georgia. She's the closest out of anyone to an indictment, I would, and I would imagine the closest to any sort of real prosecution. I, de I definitely don't think that Merrick Garland will come anytime soon. I think that that investigation is still ongoing. It may happen, but to your last question, if it doesn't, I think it sends a terrible message as to the two-tiered justice system in America that we all know exists. And then the question becomes, how bad do you have to be to be held accountable? We've seen this right. man be a part of and spearhead so many different things. The question is, when does the road hit the rubber and he have to be held accountable? 
Yeah, that, that's such a good, I think, point that uh, Charles is making um, about what it, the message it sends to everybody else. I am curious, though, because we're in a group chat room when this came out. Right. We, we're all talking about it all week, and you seem underwhelmed, yeah. I think, by Tish James's charges. But there is something about, you know, if this goes through, this is pretty much the death of the Trump organization. His kids are now in the line of fire. Not that he cares about his kids right. necessarily. Really about um, yeah. But what he does care about is his fragile ego. Yeah. So this does have some consequence, I think. I, I mean, he's the Jordan meme when it comes to his kids. You know, yeah. how I feel yes. about those kids. Yeah. But here's the thing: if the speed, you know, justice delayed, justice denied, whatever phrase you want to use. Until something actually happens, it's just a process. And I think, frankly, we have already seen an erosion in public faith in our justice system yeah. because this has taken so long. How yeah. many times do you and I talk to people who don't do this for a living who are like, man, if I took four staplers from my office when I left, yeah. I'd be in jail right now. I'd be in civil court. So this guy has continued to flaunt the law, come up with excuses, not face any consequences. And, and this thing that he tried this week, we're like, well, it's not fair for you to prosecute me because I'm a candidate It's 60 days from election. That's like calling shotgun once freshman year of college and saying, I got shotgun for the rest of my yeah, life. No, yeah. You can't say you're a perpetual candidate, so you can't be prosecuted. So yeah. again, the longer he goes, anybody goes without going to jail, the more the public feels, gosh, I guess these elites really are immune from prosecution. And you know, it's, it's something about covering all of this as well. Like I'm sitting here with, you know, a, a desk full of Trump sound bites that I just <laughs> refuse to play because right. he is, this is actually working in his favor in the sense that he's back where he wants to be mm -hmm. in the center of the limelight with people talking about him. I mean, on this show, we try to get in other things, but right. this, you know, feeds his, his fragile ego. I want to shift gears a little bit because we have uh, Charles here and, and get in a question on Jenny Thomas, because as we talk about uh, people not being held accountable and looking at this justice system, Jenny Thomas is a problem. I'm curious, how is it that she was able to negotiate how she appears before the January 6th committee? She's not an elected official. She is not covered, as, I, as far as I know, she's not covered by any uh, amount of security clearance or anything like that. And so when we look at this, it, it, it's just a head scratch, you know, that we're, we're the audacity that these women will find. I want to use another term for women like her, but the audacity. How does that even uh, work, Charles? Well, Tiffany, I could explain some of this if I didn't have uh, the outs on the group chat, so I'm going to ask to be included <laughs> in that. But, we'll add you, uh, brother. <laughs> well, all jokes aside, I think it's a combination of privilege and I think it's a combination of strategy. And when I say strategy, if Jenny Thomas decides not to cooperate with the January 6th Commission, then that means that they have to go and get a subpoena and go through the court in order to do that. That is time that they don't have and time that they cannot waste. She understands that. And so I think a part of it was the strategy around her knowing I have a little bit of flex that I can impose on the, the January 6th committee, if only because of the fact that the time that it's going to take for them to get a subpoena in order for make, to make me appear is going to be limited. And so I think that that's something that she had in her mind. And then on top of that, again, it's the notion of privilege. She has the privilege of being able to say, I don't have to follow your rules. And I think that it's really important in terms of public confidence and public faith in all of these institutions, as well as public faith in the process that her feet are held to the fire and that it's very clear that she is not above the rules and has to comply like everybody else. So I'm interested to see how this shapes out once she actually shows up and has to answer questions. Yeah, this is the, the laws of the Karens, you know, that have to be uh, um, adjusted. And, you know, honestly, we rarely hear, uh, you know, Jamal Jenkins of Southwest D.C. is negotiating when right. he's going to show up and talk to lawmakers um, or, you know, people in the justice system. Um, so for all of this stuff, though, because we're seeing Jenny Thomas, we're seeing Trump, mm -hmm. um, it, it, I always say, like, we cannot separate extremists from the Republican Party. They have morphed into one. Will this make any difference or impact with Republican voters this midterm uh, season as we we vote down ballot. No, not at all. Like, first off, they're not... What does not, that say, though? They, that it doesn't make a difference. But they, they never cared. Yeah. They, that's the thing. Yeah. They're not... Listen, they're not watching The Cross Connection, right? <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? Believe it or not, MAGA's <laughs> not really watching The Cross Connection. Maybe some I IG people. I can't tell by my mentions. Exactly, but, okay. exactly, exactly. So, so that's the thing. They're not even getting this information. Yeah. What they have heard is that migrants are invading their home, uh, that transgender children are in the Olympics, and yeah. that Joe Biden is giving out free cell phones to black people. They're not hearing this yeah. information. So it doesn't have any uh, impact 
impact on the vote. But what it does have an impact on, and this is what we talk about all the time, to the degree that it looks like our federal government isn't holding these people accountable, you have your independent voters, you have your African-American voters, your Latino voters who are like, man, I see this system bring down hellfire on my community all the time, but it's not bringing it down on them. Why should I believe in this party? Why should I believe in the ruling party? That's where this has an electoral impact, because it doesn't change MAGA voters' opinions at all. This is a cult. It's not a political party. It's a dime store front for a terrorist organization. I've been saying that for years. And so the electoral impact is more on the people who need to be motivated, not by the people who are dedicated to yeah, a cult. Yeah. All right. Well, Jason is going to stick around uh, for many more segments. And um, Charles Coleman Jr., I will add you to the group chat if you get me that T-shirt, my friend. Even exchange, quid pro quo.